Before you're seated, I want you to get your word out and go to Psalm 23. If you don't have your word, get your phone, open up your Bible app, your Bible book, whatever you got. Psalm 23. And while today I really just want to focus on the first verse, I want to read the whole psalm. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Many of you would be able to quote this, and I would imagine that if you would quote it, you would quote it in the King James. But I'm going to read today from the New Living Translation. This is a psalm of David written probably around 3,000-ish years ago. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil, my cup overflows with blessing. Verse 6, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Would you, would you join, in me, join me in prayer? And would you also pray for me this morning? that the Lord would just help me to get out of His way. Father, we just thank You for Your Word that brings life, for Your Word that changes our lives. Holy Spirit, have absolute and complete freedom in this place. And God, those who are joining us online, You're not limited by time or space, whether they're watching us right now or after the fact. Father, we pray Lord, that you would be as active in their presence as you are in ours. God, as we unpack this word, speak to us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. And Lifehouse said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I want to give. Uh, Real quick, special honor and thank you to Shelly Wilson. And yeah, come on. I said, give, listen. And her husband, Wayne, and then uh, his sister, Stephanie, and their friend, Neil, for joining us today uh, and leading worship for us while our incredible worship leader, Don, takes a Sunday off. Can we give it up for Don? Maybe he's watching, maybe he's not. But Don, if you're watching, I hope you know that you are loved and highly valued, uh, and Lindsay too, I guess. Um, but uh, man, I really hope they're watching. They are. Oh, they are? Okay, good. But, uh, but, uh, but Shelly, thank you guys so much for being here today. And uh, we were talking before service started, don't you guys think that they should come back and join us one day while, while Don and, and the rest of the team is here? Don't you think that would be great? So... For those of you who don't know, Don uh, sat under and served uh, with Shelly uh, before coming here to Lifehouse. That's why Don's so awesome. It's because he sat under an incredible worship leader. So uh, one more time, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. So I try to usually, now you got, you're not going to believe this, but, but normally I work really hard to try to come up with a creative and thought-provoking sermon title. You don't believe me, do you? You're like, really? I promise I do. Just ask my wife. I really do. And I'll go to her and be like, what do you think about this one? And she, it doesn't matter what it is. She's always like, yeah, that's great. In other words, she's like, can you please stop asking me and just pick one already? Because they're all fine, whatever. But I, I really do try to pick creative, interesting sermon titles that, that you don't, and this is, this is for me a good sermon title. One that doesn't make sense until the end of the message. 
That's my favorite kind. I don't know that I've ever truly succeeded in that, but to me, I've tried to do that. So today is going to be completely different because it's, this is not a good one, but it's the best I could come up with, and it's really just a question. And here's the sermon title and the question that I want you to ask yourself throughout the remainder of this message. Is the Lord your shepherd? Is the Lord your shepherd? Now, off the cuff, you probably would say, well, yeah, yeah, he's my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, right? But, but in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you some qualifying questions to help you uh, discern whether or not the Lord really is your shepherd. Um, with that thought in mind, a complete 180, but maybe it'll make sense in just a moment. Uh, the other day, uh, I was sitting in the living room, and I heard Kristen ask Julia, if Ju- and Julia is my middle child, and asked Julia if she wanted to uh, start the dishwasher. And can you explain to me what that entailed for her? You put the soap in the dishwasher, you shut the dishwasher, and then you push the button on the dishwasher. And this is what I heard from the other end of the house. Kristen says, Julia, would you like to start the dishwasher? And Julia goes, yes! I would love to do that! Do you guys remember when chores used to be fun? I don't, really. I don't really, except there was this one time, and and some of you have heard this story before, but just pretend like, wow, this is a new story that I've never heard before about Pastor Drew's life. This is amazing. This changed my life. So so I was probably about Julia's age, and we just got our very first riding lawnmower. And it was a Murray lawnmower. Can I get a witness for Walmart lawnmowers? It was like 38 inches, you know, which at the time was like, you know, 1992. I think that was a big one. Right? And the best thing about this lawnmower is that it wasn't a push lawnmower. Can I get a witness in the house today? And I really wanted to use it. Um, and, and I had used the push lawnmower, except it was very difficult because I had to push it from the bottom rung. You know what I'm talking about? Like the little, you know, the, the bottom one, the one that's not meant for pushing, but when you're seven years old, it's the only one you can reach. I still struggle to reach the top of some of them today, but that's another story for another sermon for another day. And so anyway, I'm asking my dad, dad, can I please, can I please ride and cut grass on the new riding lawnmower? And so of course I couldn't reach the pedals, but on this lawnmower, you really didn't have to reach the pedals except for the brake because he could put it in gear and then I could go and, and that was that. So, you know, now today I I try to, to not cut grass. That's like one of my main goals in life is to not have to cut the yard. Uh, And back then, you know, I wanted to cut the grass even when the grass didn't need to be cut. So one day I was out cutting the grass, and um, I don't really remember how I got it started, but to the best of my knowledge, I got it on it by myself, got it started by myself, got it in gear by myself. And you know how memories are. I might be telling it wrong, but this is my sermon. I'll preach it how I want to. And and so I'm I'm cutting the front yard. I do remember this. I'm cutting the front yard, and my dad walks out, and he's standing on the driveway. And um, he's standing there, and he's doing like this. And, and I'm just, you know, I'm making like my third lap, and I, I'm not ready to stop. I don't really know what the problem is, but I am cutting grass. I'm a big boy, and I am riding the riding lawnmower, and I don't want to stop. So, so I just kind of keep going, and, and I ignore him. And when I make the turn where I'd be facing him, I kind of do one of these, you know. So that way, when he's asked me later, why didn't you stop? I go, oh, I didn't, I didn't see you there. I'm, I don't know what happened. I didn't see the... I didn't see you. So eventually, he walks out towards me. And at this point, I, don't, you know, I, I have no choice but to stop or run over my father. And so I stopped the lawnmower, or he stops it for me. I actually think it's what happened. And, uh, and he you know, throws it out of gear. And he looks at me and says, Son, why didn't you come? Why didn't you come to me? I was still on the driveway waving towards you. I know you saw me. And I said, I said to him, I said, well, I didn't want to stop cutting grass. And he said, well, you haven't been cutting grass because you've been riding around in circles with the deck all the way up. And if you wanted to cut grass, you needed to come over to where I was so I could lower the deck for you so you could actually cut some grass. And so I tell that story, and I know I've told it before, but remember, you've heard it for the first time today, right? Amen, amen, amen. I tell that story because oftentimes I feel like that is a picture of me and God. 
And, and, and you know, memories are so funny. Like, that's just one of, like, I don't know why that memory sticks out in my mind. But there are so many times in my life where I feel like my Heavenly Father is going, hey, remember that time when you thought you were cutting grass, but you were really just riding around in circles not doing anything worth doing? Yeah, that's what you're doing right now. That's, you're doing it again. And he stands there and he's getting, you know, and the Holy Spirit's getting my attention with his kind and gentle promptings. We often call it conviction. Sometimes we get it in his word. And yet, so often in my life, I find myself doing one of these. Oh, I didn't see you there, Lord. I didn't, I didn't sense you there, Holy Spirit, when I did that thing or made that purchase or said that word or posted that thing on Facebook. And I know that in reality, he's just a loving father trying to get my attention and help me to do the thing that I really want to do, but sometimes I don't do that thing. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? Come on, help me out today. Do, do, are you, I'm going to say it again. You smell what I'm stepping in? Okay. You can make fun of me later. So, here we are in Psalm 23. And, and David, we don't really know when David wrote this psalm, but we do know a few things about David. And one of the things that we know for sure about David is that David, before he was a king, he was a shepherd. In fact, we're introduced to David when Samuel the prophet is instructed by God to go to Jesse's house where you are going to anoint the next king of Israel. And so Samuel shows up at Jesse's house and, and he goes to Jesse and he says, I need to see your sons. And Jesse has like 52 kids and he lines them all up. And he, Samuel looks at each and every one of them. And in a few different times, Samuel looks at them and, and he says to himself, surely this guy is going to be the next king because he looks like somebody who should be king. And, and the Holy Spirit or God the Father says to, to Samuel, no, 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 not this one, not this guy. Uh, and then, No, no, not this one. Not this, no, no, not this one. And he goes on down the line. And finally, Samuel looks at Jesse and he says, Jesse, you got any more kids? And, and Jesse says, well, yeah, I got one. You know, he's, yeah, this my other son, David. He's out in the field tending the sheep. And Samuel says, well, bring him here to me. And a little side note of interest here. Some, some theologians believe that David was actually an illegitimate child of Jesse, which is why he was treated so harshly by his family, but also why David says in the Psalms, in sin did my mother conceive me. It's not a proven fact. We don't know for sure, but it's, some people do believe that that to be the case. And so, so they go and they, they, they get David and David comes and Samuel sees him and immediately he hears the voice of God saying to Samuel, Samuel, uh, this is going to be the next king. And, and so Samuel anoints David and David's just a, a young person. He's probably a teenager. I, and, and you know what's funny is you read through this and you understand that today like when we anoint people with oil, we, we, you know, I don't see any bottles, but we, we kind of abide by the policy, a little dab will do you. <laughs> we, you know, we get a little bit on our fingertip and we put it right there and we're like, Lord bless you, Lord keep you, let his face shine among, upon you. And yes, amen. Uh, but back in the day, uh, when somebody got anointed with oil, they basically took a, a barrel and they dumped it on their head. And so, you know, David being a teenager, you got to know that that uh, caused a pretty severe acne breakout. And, uh, but anyway, David, he goes back, he gets anointed to be king. Now I want you to like follow this for just a moment. David is anointed to be a king. And then he just goes back to being a shepherd again for, for actually for many years. And, and, and so, so David knew a lot about sheep. He knew a lot about being a shepherd. And so we don't know exactly when he wrote Psalm 23. Maybe he wrote it as a teenager. Maybe he wrote it later in life reflecting upon his days as a shepherd. But as a shepherd, or as a former shepherd, it made sense for David to compare his relationship to God to a, a sheep and a shepherd. And we do this too. You know, I, as a dad, I do it really quite often, uh, understanding uh, how God might see me compared to the way I see my children and vice versa. Even Jesus talked about this in, in, in the Gospels. He talked about, you know, he, he compared and contrasted a relationship with parents to children and, and God and, and, and His children. 
And so David, as he's writing this psalm, there's some things that are on David's mind that we need to be aware of. And first thing is like David understood sheep. And so if the Lord is my shepherd, then what does that make me and you? It's not a trick question, I promise. It makes us a sheep. So here are a few things you need to know about sheep. And I don't mean to insult you, but here they are. Sheep are, they're, 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 they're not that smart. Like they really don't know what's going on, okay? They're just sort of along for the ride, wherever the shepherd takes them. Sheep are directionless. Like, for instance, they can only see what's immediately in front of them. And so if the thing in front of them might cause them to wander away from the shepherd, more often than not, they will wander away from the shepherd and the safety of the flock, and they will be led into a place that they may not want to go in search of something that they think is going to be better for them than whatever the shepherd has for them. Sheep are very easily lured away. Very easily distracted. Sheep, now we don't like this one because we're Americans and we take pride in being Americans. And, and as an American, I actually take pride in this very much as well. But we have to understand that being a citizen of our country versus being a citizen of the kingdom are very different things. And so as a citizen of this country, I take pride in my independence. But as a citizen of the kingdom, it, it, uh, independence is not something that I should desire. In fact, Jesus actually talks about in Revelation when he is talking to John and he's talking about the different churches. He says, uh, tell this church that they think they're rich, they're full, and they have need of nothing. Yet, what they don't realize is because of their perceived independence, they are actually blind and naked, wretched and poor. And so, so a desirable trait as a citizen of our country is independence. A desirable trait for an 18-year-old or 21-year-old is independence. But a desirable trait for a citizen of the kingdom is a holy dependence. And so sheep are very dependent on the shepherd. Different than a goat, right? A goat is independent. A goat is stubborn. A goat, and I don't know this. I just read it in a book. I've never really been around goats a whole lot, so I'm just taking Philip Keller's word for it. If you've ever read the book, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, that's where my information's coming from. But, but goats are very different. Sheep, however, need care that they cannot give themselves. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with this illustration because I'm a squeamish person and it makes me grossed out when I talk about it. But in the Middle East and in Africa, sheep are very uh, liable to get something called a, a, a bot fly in their nose. It's really gross. You can look it up yourself if you want to later, but I wouldn't if I were you. And the shepherd, with oil and with care, can help them through that situation. However, if a sheep is left to his or her own devices with that parasite in their nose, they are liable to literally beat themselves to death trying to get that parasite out of their nose, hitting their head up against a tree or a rock. That'll preach right there. How often? Trying to do it on our own. Trying to make it work on our own. Do we hurt ourselves more than we help ourselves? If instead we would just go to the one who can touch us, who can heal us, who can help us. You see, sheep are very dependent. And a shepherd, different than a sheep, whereas a sheep is prone to wandering and a sheep really and truly isn't that intelligent and really can't see that far and really doesn't know that much. A shepherd has, has vision for the bigger picture. They can see and they can understand what you or I can't really see in that moment. They can discern between what looks good and what is good. Because, and hear me and understand and say amen if you agree, what oftentimes looks good isn't actually good. And oftentimes, what is actually good don't always look good. 
And a shepherd, unlike a sheep, can tell the difference. Because a shepherd knows ultimately what's best for a sheep. And whereas a sheep is very dependent and needs immediate and constant care, the beautiful thing is a good shepherd is a compassionate shepherd. And a good shepherd doesn't just care for the flock. A good shepherd cares for each and every individual sheep. And I know we say this a lot at Lifehouse Church. And I hope that we say it enough that you remember it. But I hope that it never becomes just another quote, motto, or slogan. And we say that the mission of our church and the purpose of our church is to show the world that they are loved and highly valued. But I would submit to you, until God does it and shows it to you first, He can't do it through you. So I want you to hear it, and I want you to know it, and I want you to tell yourself, even right now in this moment, I am loved and highly valued. Jesus said it like this in Matthew, in Matthew 10. He says, what is the price of two sparrows? Maybe a copper coin. In other words, they're, they're worthless. They're, they're, not, they're, they're of very little value. What, what's the price of two birds? Eh, not enough to even count. He says this, though. He says, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And then he says, and the very hairs on your head are numbered. Even you, Chad. Even you, buddy. Six. The very, so for some of us, it's the very hairs on your back are numbered, right? I did, that was funny. I didn't say it in first service. It just came to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that was the Lord. You probably don't agree, and you're probably right, but whatever. He said, and Jesus says this. He says, so don't be afraid, because you are so much more valuable than a whole flock of sparrows. I, I, I truly believe, and I, and I preach this to myself as much as I preach it to you, that if we could really know the love of God, for each and every one of us, we would never be worried about a thing. We would never be afraid. We would never lose peace. We would never lose joy if we really knew how much we were loved by our Heavenly Father. So this is what David says, and I'm just going to break down the very first verse of, of the six verses, and, 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 and I just, I'll just want to take a few moments to unpack them. This is what he says. The Lord is my shepherd, which leads me to the question I need you to ask yourself. Like, ask yourself out loud right now. Is the Lord my shepherd? Is the Lord my shepherd? Because here, and here's the qualifying questions. Number one, do you follow him? When he leads you somewhere, do you go where he leads you? Do you, do you follow where the shepherd goes? Or do you, do you go your own way? Do you run from him? Because remember, the question we're asking ourselves this morning is, is the Lord my shepherd? In order for the Lord to be my shepherd, I have to actually follow him. I have to be going where he's going. Now today, I'm not really talking about salvation. I'm not really talking about heaven or hell. But, but I am talking about your level of commitment to the shepherd, to the good shepherd, to the Lord who wants to be your shepherd, who wants to lead you. And so the first question you really need to honestly ask yourself is, do I go where he goes? Do I follow where he leads? The next one is, do I listen to his voice? Or do I ignore him? Because I would submit to you that many of us, myself so often included, are like my seven-year-old self, riding around in circles, and the Holy Spirit is yelling out to us, motioning to us spiritually, saying, come this way. Come over here. Yet, we do one of those. And we look the other way because we have this fear and we have this thought that I know better for me than he knows better for, than for me. So do you listen to him or do you ignore him? Do you actively seek his presence or do you find joy away from him? When's the last time you just sat somewhere by yourself 
and invited the Holy Spirit to just be in the room with you without another distraction, without somebody else, without an agenda, without a, without a list of things He needs to do for you. When's the last time you just enjoyed His presence? Is the Lord your shepherd? Lastly, do you obey His voice? Or do you choose to live independent from Him? You see, the beauty though is that when the Lord is my shepherd, we are afforded certain benefits. And, and David says it like this, The Lord is my shepherd. Maybe I should say it like this. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. Or if you memorize it in the King James, I believe it says it like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Which actually is a better translation of the original Hebrew because there is the negative modifying adverb. I believe I said that correctly. The word not is actually in the original language. And, and the reason why that's there is because David is actually trying to paint a word picture that would help us understand what it means to live uh, what, what life looks like when the Lord is our shepherd. And so, so what he's doing, he's actually illustrating uh, like, like an account registry, like a checkbook or an Excel sheet, even though I don't think David was very familiar with Excel sheets. But so, so you know like an account registry or an Excel sheet, if you've got money in there and you get to the bottom of the page and it's in red, what does that mean? AJ, what does it mean? You should know. You're, you're in the red. You're in the negative. You, you're, you're spending more than you're making. You're living in a deficit. Sorry, I just you did it. You said it earlier. I couldn't help. Please forgive me. Or don't. I don't care. I do care. Please don't be mad at me. So the, the, the way uh, David is illustrating it is, when the Lord is my shepherd, I don't live at a deficit. Instead, I live in a surplus. And so he says, I shall not want. To be in want conveys deficit. To not be in want conveys surplus. In other words, I will have no lack. When the Lord is my shepherd, I can always trust Him. Say the word always. I can always trust Him to supply every need that I might have. In other words, life may not always be good, but He is. When the Lord is my shepherd, I will have no lack. When the Lord is my shepherd, I will have no want. When the Lord is my shepherd, He takes delight in delighting me. You know how I know that? You know how that I know that our Heavenly Father delights in delighting me and delighting you? It's because one of the best feelings in the world for me is to bring joy to one of my children. And listen, I got so many issues, my issues got issues, yet I'm a decent enough parent to want to make my kids happy. How much more does our Heavenly Father, who is perfect, who is good, and who is able, delight in giving good gifts to His children? He takes delight in delighting us. But, but there's something else that you need to see here. When the Lord is my shepherd, I find contentment comes so much easier. In other words, power, prestige, popularity, possessions, any other P word that is something that we might, I don't know, I can't, I, I tried to think of some good words that, that work together, but first service had a few to help me out, but I can't remember any of them now. Money, cars, homes, guitars, although that, Jazz master is looking pretty sweet back there. I'm just going to tell you. They don't hold as much weight and as much sway in my life when the Lord is my shepherd. Because contentment just comes easier. You see, I can trust that since He knows me so much better than I know me, and you need to hear that too. Like, He knows you. He knows what makes you tick better than you know what makes you tick. And, and, and there's some, some theology a lot of us need to fix. We, and we, we, we say things like, I hope God never asks me to do blank. You know, I went to, 
I went to Bible college, and I would hear it all the time. I hope God never asks me to be in children's ministry. Or to be a missionary. Or to go here. Or to go to this state like Ohio. Someplace like that. Nobody wants to go there. <laughs> Chad's counting over here. <laughs> but, but how messed up is that? That we think our good Father who loves us, who made us, who knows us, would, would ask us and make us do things that we say we don't want to do. And so we literally say things, well, I better not say that, then God's going to make me do it. Man, that's some jacked up theology right there. Now, that is not to say that sometimes the Lord will not ask you to do things that you may not want to do, but He asks you to do them because He knows you better than you know you, and He's trying to do something in you and not necessarily just something for you. Maybe he's trying to pull something out of you that's going to take some squeezing, that's going to take some trial, that's going to take a little work, that's going to take some stress. Maybe, maybe he might do, the, do that to you in some situations, but it's not because he's a mean old man up in the sky ready to zap you with the thing that you don't want to do as soon as you mess up or as soon as you say it out loud. It's because he's a good father and he's more concerned about what he does in you than what he does for you. It's because he's a good father and ultimately he's more concerned about who you're becoming than even who you are right now in the moment. I mean, but isn't that the definition of a good parent? A parent that, that, that will do the hard thing in the moment because they know that ultimately it's going to lead to the right thing in the long run. The Bible even says uh, in Hebrews that, that God disciplines those that He loves. And you know what discipline means? It's not, it, you know, it's not like, <laughs> it's not a bad word. Discipline is, is, it basically means choosing what I want most over what I want now. And God is willing to let us go through seasons and situations that, that, that turn out better in the long run because he, he sees the whole picture. Ultimately, though, He wants good for me and He wants good for you better than you want good for you. My pastor used to say when I was a teenager and I was going to church, the, he, he used to say that God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. The problem is that we don't do a good job of positioning ourselves to receive the blessings. In other words, He's not our shepherd. In other words, we're not following Him. We're not listening to Him. We're not obeying Him. We're not positioning ourselves under the covering of our shepherd. You see, when the Lord is my shepherd, I live from a place of surplus, not deficit. I live from a place of victory, not defeat. I live from a place of abundance, not lack. I live from a place of prosperity, not poverty. And we're not talking about finances. We're not talking about bank accounts. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're actually talking about a state of being. We're talking about a mindset. We're talking about the way we see the world. We're talking about seeing, this is going to sound a little cheesy, but, but we're talking about seeing the, the glass half full instead of glass half empty type of, of mentality and type of theology. Where, uh, let me say it like this, and, and I'm, I'm going off track, so I need you to say amen here in a little bit just to make me feel good about myself. But I remember watching this Netflix documentary about a specific basketball player in the mid-90s whom I will not name because if you've seen the documentary, you might judge me for watching it. He played for a team that was... Um, it rhymed with fools. <laughs> His name rhymes with Schmeichel Schmorden. <laughs> but you know what was amazing about Michael Jordan as an athlete? I mean, I mean Schmeichel Schmorden. <laughs> For the Chicago Schmoles. <laughs> he never, ever thought he would lose a game. He never thought he would lose a game. He never watched the game film of an opponent and thought, oh man, I don't know if we got a chance against these guys. He always believed he was going to win. And a lot of people of God would do a really good job to adopt that mentality in our own lives. Because so many of us wake up in the morning thinking, what's going to go wrong today? What's going to mess up today? 
What's going to break today? What bill's going to come in today? What's going to happen bad today? And a lot of us would do really good to start waking up in the morning and thinking to ourselves, what good thing is God going to do in my life and through my life today? Man, I need to call the first service back and tell them that story because that is so much better preaching than you're letting on. You see, when the Lord is my shepherd, I have all the rest that I need. Not because I get enough sleep, but because He is my Sabbath. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have all the energy I need. Not because of, of, of my diet. Lord knows that's not why I have it. it. Wasn't that funny, Carla? Calm down. Because He's my source, right? He's my source of life. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have all the wisdom that I need. Because guess what? He knows everything. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have all the provision I need because He is my provider, not my job or the government or my retirement when I get one one day. Those things aren't my provision. He's my provision. When the Lord is my shepherd, He's my healing because He is my great physician. When the Lord is my shepherd, He's my peace because He is the gift of peace. He is peace. He is, the Bible says, He is the Prince of Peace. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have joy no matter what's happening out here because joy isn't what happens out here. It's what God's doing in here. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need because I have Him. Worship team, will you guys go ahead and come? One thing that the last few months have really showed me about life is that I have zero control. Like, even as a pastor, I don't even have control over having church next week. Like, man, that was a hard pill to swallow. Can I just be honest with you? I don't have control over the weather. I don't have control over the economy. I don't, I don't even have control over my own body. I mean, like, there could be something wrong with me that I didn't do. I don't have control over other people. I don't have control over other drivers, no matter how much I tailgate, no matter how much I honk at them. Amen. I don't have a lot of control. I can't can't even really depend on myself. I can't depend on you. Not, not totally. I mean, like, I can depend on you. But, like, I can't depend on you the way I can depend on Him. I can't depend on me the way I can depend on Him. Because there are no certainties in this life except Him, right? I can trust Him completely. I can trust Him totally. I can trust Him wholly. Because He is my shepherd. And He is the good shepherd. He is wise beyond compare. He is good beyond words. He is strong beyond measure. He is able in every situation and in every season and in all circumstances to be there for me, to make a way for me, to help me, to guide me, to lead me, to provide for me, to encourage me, to fill me with joy, to to fill me with peace. But the question that you need to ask yourself today is, is he my shepherd? Because in order for him to be your shepherd, that means you're following him. That means you stay close to him. That means you seek after his presence. That means that when he speaks, you don't ignore his promptings. When the Lord is my shepherd, I will never face a situation I will never have a need. I will never go through a season where He will not be there for me. Where He will not make a way for me. Where He will not somehow, in some capacity, provide for me. And and this, I, I felt the Holy Spirit just speak this to me this morning. It wasn't originally part of my message, but I just wanted to share it. If I had to sum the Christian life up into three words, to to follow Him, to live for Him, to, 
to belong to the good shepherd, it would be this. Listen, obey, and trust. Listen for his word. And, and, and don't tell me God's not speaking because if you've got one of these, he's speaking. You just need to open it and get to work. Listen to his voice. And then obey it. I love, I love what AJ said. How he just, he just obeyed. He just, it was hard at first, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. And that could, it applies to anything the Holy Spirit's asking you to do. It could be being obedient in your tithing. It could be being obedient in, in witnessing to a neighbor or, or, or anything. So what does God want from me? Okay. And then the second thing is being obedient to the thing that you know God wants from you. No matter how difficult it might seem, no matter how challenging it might feel, sometimes no matter how scary it might be, listen, obey, and then just trust God with the outcome. Whatever it is, He's the one who told me to do it. I did it to the best of my ability, uh, ability to the way He told me to do it. And so now I'm just going to trust God with what I've done. Listen, obey, and trust. So one more time, with every head bow and every eye closed, I want to ask you this question today. Is the Lord your shepherd? Come on, if you're watching online, is the Lord your shepherd? Or have you wandered away? Have you strayed off course? Have you allowed distractions to deceive you? And if you have, there's no need to feel bad about it. There's no need to feel guilty about it. There's only one response you need to do today. And that is to listen to His voice. To hear His call. To obey His word. And then to trust Him completely. Listen. Obey. This morning, we're going to take a few more moments to worship and to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. So I just want to ask that you wouldn't leave, you wouldn't get up and move around. But I do want to ask that today, if your commitment is to listen for His voice, to obey His Word, and to trust Him with your life in every capacity, in all situations, in all circumstances, would you make that commitment known to Him by just standing to your feet as we worship Him for a few more minutes?